Ah, ha, ha. Oh, that's hot. That's hot. Hey everyone, I'm back with a brand new video today. Today I'm doing my Let's Talk on Star Wars The Last Jedi. Now, before I begin this video, I just want to quickly say that I just turned 20 a few days ago at the time of recording this. I did a Star Wars marathon that night on my birthday and it took me almost 24 hours. I watched every single Star Wars feature film that's come out, so 11 movies. Yeah! It's surprisingly enough, this time when I did this marathon, I liked The Last Jedi more than I did before the marathon. That said, I still think this is the worst Star Wars movie and despite me having a poster on my wall, I'll grab it, which is this one here. The poster looks great, that's probably the really only good thing, the poster looks amazing. Um, and despite me having this poster on my wall, it's still a terrible Star Wars movie. It's a very well made movie, it looks amazing, but the writing's just terrible, the direction of the Skywalker saga is bad. Had this been a non-Skywalker film, I would be fine with the story. But it's a Skywalker film, so it's just terrible direction. And the score, I love John Williams, but this score, that doesn't feel like there's anything popping out from it. Like, every Star Wars film has at least one track which is just amazing and really great. This one doesn't really have any. It relies too heavily on... Um, the original Star Wars trilogy themes. And the only good new track we get is the Canto Bight theme. And the Canto Bight scenes are terrible in this movie. Ryan Johnson directs this film, he also wrote it. And I went in with high expectations for this film. Obviously, expecting a lot of the questions that we had uh, asked in The Force Awakens and that were set up in The Force Awakens to be answered. And they weren't. And I don't care if you say you subverted my expectations because there is a point where subverting expectations essentially becomes lazy writing and just not giving a there. about the story. I think subverting expectations is a good idea. You have a plot twist here and there. You know, that's really, I didn't see that coming. Wow, that's amazing. I didn't see that twist come. But then when you do that, yeah, so often and when you do it with scenes that don't need the subversion or which are ruined by the method of which you subvert expectations then you're just not making a great movie. You write characters one way when they were set up to be another. Luke Skywalker is in The Force Awakens for a few minutes and then he looks like he's the Jedi who was pondering something big who was uh, astounded by seeing his lightsaber again. And then you have him throw the lightsaber away over his shoulder and it's, it's just ridiculous. It's, I saw this in Midnight and I can say a handful of people laughed when this happened. I didn't laugh because I was like, what the hell is this? Why the hell would you do this? Even if you want to show Luke be disconnected from the Force or be disconnected from the Jedi, you don't need to have him do it in a comedic manner. You could have him do it in a more serious tone, something that would still suit your story that you're writing since Ryan Johnson clearly said that he doesn't care about the fans, but he's caring about the story that he wants to write. Can I just say yes. though, a lot of times I would say to Ryan, we gotta think about the fans. Yeah. And he said, no, we gotta think about the story and we gotta think about our movie. Clearly, it's not the story that needs to be told because so many different changes occur between this film and The Force Awakens that really just make this a disconnected sequel. And as sequels go, this is a pretty terrible sequel. You set up a lot in The Force Awakens and then you don't get the payoffs in The Last Jedi. Sure, there is Episode 9, which will come out and that can still give payoffs to stuff set up in The Force Awakens and that's fine. But with The Last Jedi having changed so much, you kind of expect even more questions to be raised now and even more explanations needed to be given as to explain why certain things occurred in The Force Awakens or were set up in The Force Awakens and not solved, at least partially solved or even hinted at in the sequel. I want to talk more about the writing of this film because it is atrocious, but I will leave that for when I do a deep an analysis of this and that will go on for a while. So let's move on to the characters themselves. Um, for the most part, they're consistent from what they were in The Force Awakens. Uh, Rey is still an overpowered 
character with no real explanation for her powers. We see her train with a lightsaber once, and that it doesn't look like the best training, and she does it by herself without anyone teaching her how to handle the lightsaber. She does stuff up though, and the only reason she stuffs up is because she sees Luke watching her. She doesn't stuff up because she doesn't know how to handle it, but because she loses her concentration. You know, it's not that she just fumbled with it or just didn't know how to use it properly. She just got distracted. And that's not really much of a learning curve for a character to have. Finn is still the stormtrooper who is a cracking jokes and not really the warrior type of guy. And apparently he's also mopped the area where the First Order have their tracking, hyperspace tracking running from. Yet he is surprised when he hears that hyperspace tracking is a thing. It's very weird and it doesn't make sense. And he's really just there for no other reason but because he was in The Force Awakens. He also wakes up from the coma he was in so easily. Just This movie takes place a few hours to a day, maximum a day, after The Force Awakens. So he got hit by a lightsaber across his back and he got knocked straight out. And then he wakes up at the next day and he's perfectly fine. He's walking around in this suit full of water and is just spewing everywhere. Yet every other member of the resistance just decides to walk past him and just ignore him. It's just, it's just there for comedic effect and it, it doesn't need to be there because it doesn't make sense, you know? I like comedy and I get that Star Wars films to some people are just, you know, fantasy. They're just stupid action and stuff like that, stupid sci-fi, but it's not. I don't care who the hell you are, Ryan Johnson, you can say that you were a fan like us, like me, but clearly you're more of an... But clearly you're more of a person who doesn't know how to handle such a movie than a person who truly understands it like a fan does. Carrying on, Luke, as I said earlier, is really just so wrong. He's too comedic, he's also too depressing at times, he's too inconsistent, and for some reason he has disconnected from the Force. I don't know why you had to do that. I actually have a video which I actually have made already, have edited, and I'm going to upload that in a few weeks on why Luke Skywalker doesn't work in The Last Jedi. And I actually give a reason in that video on why or how he could be resolved with what the film actually gives. Uh, Kylo Ren is, for the most part, consistent. He's still uh, really a brooding kind of guy who loses his temper, but he suddenly doesn't idolize Vader as much and he seeks Snoke's um, real attention more than Vader because Snoke seems, simply says that he's a child in a mask and then he gets angry at his mask. He's still the f best character in the sequel trilogy because he is a complex character and he actually goes through some flaws. We see him struggle after killing his father. He doesn't want to kill his mother. And he really just wants to let the past die. And just move on with everything. And that's a really cool quote. Let the past die. Kill it if you have to. I love it. He's the complete opposite of Rey. Rey just gets everything done. She bet Kylo Ren in the first movie. She beats Praetor Praetor Praetorian Guards. I don't know how to say that. Praetorian Guards. The Red Guards in this movie and the only time she wields a lightsaber is in The Force Awakens when she beats Kylo and in this movie when she's training by herself and then that's the only two times she uses a lightsaber as far as we can see on screen. So I'm not counting any books or whatever, I'm just saying on screen as a movie, that's all we see. And then she can beat trained guards. Kylo Ren, a guy who's been training under Luke and Snoke, struggles more than she does against this fight in the guards that she, Rey, has to come and save Kylo. Like, I get you want to make a spectacle of a fight, but you got to make a fight which is grounded within the story you're trying to tell. And I could easily go more in depth into this, but I'm going to save that for my deeper analysis. Poe has the best character arc for the protagonist in this film, although Holdo is the most useless character because the whole time I was watching this film, the first time I saw this in cinemas, I was like, she's a traitor. She's so obviously a traitor. But she's not a traitor, she just was making her decisions to not tell Poe or to not tell anyone really because I count five people apart from Poe who were present at the um, mutiny which he takes place. So to say that Holdo wasn't telling Poe because she doesn't trust him or anything 
is bull because she was even wasn't even telling some of the fellow officers and pilots and Poe, although he was demoted in the start of this movie, he blew up Starkiller Base. He was sent on a secret mission by Leia in The Force Awakens, and he's been a pilot in the Resistance for a long time. His parents fought against the Empire. So really, you can't say that just because Holdo's afraid that there's a spy on board, that she doesn't trust Poe Dameron. Later in the movie, after the mutiny, Holdo sounded like, I like Poe. I like him, he's a troublemaker. You, you don't like him. He just went from being this sad, depressed, shitty leader and then becoming this joker who's smiling and who's like may the force be with you and stuff like that I don't I don't get it it's such a terrible character Rose is the same she doesn't need to be in this movie you know Ryan Johnson is in the documentary saying that uh, she's not a character you could see in the Star Wars movie she's a nerd character she would be one of my friends something like along those lines that's not me quoting that's just me paraphrasing so why would you put a character that's not meant to be in the Star Wars universe in the Star Wars universe? It doesn't make sense, you know? If you bring them in and they suddenly fit in the story well and they actually do fit in the Star Wars universe and the story that you were writing, then yeah, that's fine if you think, oh, they won't fit in, but they end up do, that's fine. But they didn't. And you said yourself that she won't. So why would you put that character in there? Why would you do that? Why would you give us this forced Journey to Kanto Bai, which I think is a cool place. I think the idea of Kanto Bai is great, and for the most part, I like it. But then you have this whole thing with the Fathias, where they escape on the Fathias, they save these uh, horses essentially, and they liberate them so far as that they are still stuck on that planet, on the grassland right next to the uh, casino. How are they liberated when they're going to just be caught like the next day or something? When it's daylight, the people can just come on their ships and just see, oh, there they are, let's catch them. The slave kids as well, and honestly, I don't care about slave kids in the Star Wars universe. Episode 1 had slavery in it. They're like, the Republic laws don't go out here because the huts run this area. Yeah, that's fine. I get it. The huts are powerful. We know how powerful the huts are. But in this movie, they're just slave kids just there. You don't give us a reason for why there aren't slaves in the world. It just doesn't make sense. We get in The Phantom Menace why there are slaves. We don't get why they're a slave in The Last Jedi, they're just there. The Republic was just destroyed a day ago, max. So if the Republic was doing nothing about slaves, you know, and you don't give me a reason, there's something wrong with your writing. Now I'm going to talk about the final character, and that is General Hux. So apparently Ryan Johnson said that he saw General Hux as a comedic character in The Force Awakens, which is why he wrote him the way he did in The Last Jedi, but clearly he wasn't meant to be comedic in The Force Awakens because in The Force Awakens, General Hux is made out to rival Kylo Ren for Snoke's attention and such. General Hux is smart enough to escape Starkiller Base before it explodes. General Hux gives a Nazi-like speech to all of his stormtroopers as he talks about destroying the Republic, the official government system in the Star Wars universe. That's not comedic. That's not a guy you can just throw around and then expect us to take seriously as a villain. Literally, he has a your mama joke said to him. He's called General Hugs, and I don't mean H-U-X, I mean H-U-G-S by Poe Dameron several times. He is trolled by Poe Dameron, and then he is tossed around by Snoke and Kylo Ren. What doesn't make sense is that later, Snoke says, do you know why I keep a rabbit cur in such a, such a position of power? He's saying that General Hux is the rabbit cur and he's in a position of power. Yet, the person you are putting in the position of power, you toss around in front of his subordinates and you treat him like a rag doll. How does that guy expect to have power when he's treated that way in front of the people he is meant to have power over? There's no clear consistency with this character. Later on, He's made to, to be so comedic where he's like yelling what Kylo Ren is saying, just reinforcing the orders. And even Kylo Ren turns to look at him like, what the hell are you doing? You know, Kylo Ren goes from being in the stage of anger and then he just suddenly looks at him like, the hell man? And then Hux is thrown against the wall. But then the final scene we see of Hux, he's looking at Kylo Ren like, I'm going to kill you one day. Why do you have such a serious look all of a sudden? You build up this whole movie of breaking this character down into nothing. And then you suddenly make him look so serious all of a sudden. It just... 
Ryan Johnson failed at writing characters in this movie, failed at writing a sufficient story, and failed at creating a good sequel to The Force Awakens. He wasted so much good potential. He brings Captain Phasma back, she's in it for one and a half minutes, and then she dies again. Supposedly. She could come back, she just fell into fire for all I care, she could come back. Ryan Johnson said he had to care about the story, not the fans. In The Force Awakens, Snoke says that he wanted to finish off Kylo Ren's training, yet in The Last Jedi, Kylo Ren does not undergo any training. In The Force Awakens, Finn gets knocked out by a lightsaber cut across his whole back. The jacket he was wearing gets stitched up by Poe, and Finn is, wakes up a day later. Kylo Ren gets stabbed in the shoulder, both shoulders actually, cut out his leg, and a scar across his face. It's all healed in the next day. <sighs> this movie is just a terribly written Star Wars movie. I have to give credit to the production of the movie, because for the most part, it is amazing. Although I don't think they needed to have a giant titty sea monster there in that scene or even at all. They actually built that creature. They built it in a studio, then shipped it over to the island and filmed that scene. Put so much money into that for nothing. <laughs> now I have just been ranting on about this film, so let me get into something that I did like. I did like how Kylo Ren and Rey have that linkage between them and they have these conversations. That's very nice. The one problem is that the way it ends isn't that great. The fight with the Praetorian Guards and the fact that neither of them join with one another or change in any way. Kylo Ren is still the villain, he's still the bad guy, and then Rey is still the good person, just being good and just trying to save everything for no real reason and she undergoes no struggle at all in defeating Snoke or fighting the Guards or anything really. She finds out that her parents are nobody. So that whole heritage arc with her is just out of the window. And then Snoke is killed without us learning anything about him. Some people will say that uh, you didn't know anything about the Emperor in episode 4, 5, or 6. But the thing is, in episodes 4, 5, and 6, the main bad guy from the start, the big boss that we always saw as the big boss, was Darth Vader. We got mentions of the Emperor here and there. We saw him more and more as each movie came out. But the overall person that we, as an uh, audience, needed to see Luke defeat was Darth Vader. We needed to see him overcome Vader, bring Vader back from the light. That was the goal of the film. In this, The Force Awakens, the goal of the film was to defeat the dark side, basically. To defeat Kylo Ren and Snoke. There was no, uh, nothing personal between Rey and Kylo Ren. Along with that, this is a sequel trilogy to two previous trilogies. So you can't compare a movie that came out in 1977, sorry, 1980 and 1983 to a movie that's coming out in 2015, 2017, and 2019. Clearly, you have to give us more of a backstory for these characters, especially when the actor playing Snoke says that Snoke is stronger than Darth Vader and Emperor Palpatine, yet he in no way shows that power. Talking about power, let's get into the action. The action in this film is alright at best. The Praetorian Guard fight scene is good when the first time you see it, although I will go on record and say this. The first time I saw this movie in cinemas, I saw the missing blade on screen. I didn't think it was actually missing. I was like, I saw that disappear. Maybe it's just my eyes playing a trick on me. Probably just fell over. I probably just missed it because I was watching the screen, you know. But I noticed it. Second time I saw it, I definitely saw it go missing. Then I saw it a third time in cinemas and I was like, yup, it's not there. It's gone. I can't wait till this comes out on DVD. I can show it to everyone and stuff. And it is missing. And along with that, the whole fight is so poorly choreographed. The problem with this fight is that they put so much on screen to distract you from what's actually happening that you don't notice all the mistakes that are going on. Some people will say that uh, the fight scenes from the prequel trilogy are really over the top and stuff like that, but you can still see the two people fighting clearly. Even when you have General Grievous fighting with four arms against Obi-Wan Kenobi, you can tell what's going on and you can see how Obi-Wan is defect deflecting the lightsabers and cutting off the hands. In this movie, you see Rey kick three people away with one kick. It just doesn't make sense. Like, once again, go and check out that Robot Heads video on the lightsabers. If you haven't yet, make sure you go and do that because it goes into the fight scene in more detail. And the actual final fight scene between Luke and Kylo Ren is mediocre at best. I, I knew Luke was fake. Because when I saw him have the lightsaber, I saw him have the shaved, uh, clean beard. I was like, yeah, something's up. This is no way the real Luke. And then the fighting's pathetic because Luke does all this Matrix-like stuff. It's clearly CGI Luke just dancing around basically in front of 
Kylo Ren. And it's just not entertaining to watch because I know it's fake. It doesn't look that cool. It's not Luke using such cool immense power. The lightsabers don't clash or anything. It's not a fight which I care for. And there's not much emotion behind the fight either because I barely care for the tension between these two. I haven't had enough backstory between these two to care for them. Now this video has been going on for quite a while and I haven't really talked about everything I wanted to talk about. So I'm just going to end it here and save everything, all the notes I've made for my uh, deeper analysis video, which I'll do soon. I have a video on Luke Skywalker coming up in a few weeks, so be ready for that. And really, this movie is just a terrible Star Wars film. If it was not a part of the Skywalker saga, so not one of the episodic films, it would be a better film because the story would be better without the legacy characters of Luke, Han, Leia, yada yada. So overall, I would give this film a 4 or 3 out of 10 as a Star Wars film. As a film itself on its own, I'd give it a 5 or 6. Thanks for watching everyone, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more videos. I will go into The Last Jedi in more depth in my deeper analysis, which I will do sometime later this year. But for now, this is my last talk on the video. Make sure you leave a comment down below on what you thought about this film, if you've seen it yet, and how would you rank it against The Force Awakens.